Oh, thank you for the warm welcome. It's the first time I've been out this way. <laughs> oh, but I'm originally from Pennsylvania. My dad was Army and spent most of his time in the South. So at one point I got a Southern accent and moved back to Pennsylvania and picked up a Northern accent again. So I've been down here about a year and a half. I can tell you I don't say yuns and yins anymore, but I'm not sure I say y'all yet. <laughs> but I can tell you also I enjoy the weather down here so much. I do not miss the snow, the ice, and everything else. Oh, but it's been so nice. So, But again, so glad to be here and looking forward to what God's going to continue to do. I don't know about you, but do you really believe that God is here? Amen. I hope so. I mean, you even just sang about it, right? Yes. You're always working. You're always working. Yes. And he's been doing it ever since this service started. And it's not that worship is going to start now. You've already been doing it. We're just continuing it. So, Well, if you turn with me to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 27. going to spend most of our time in this chapter. It needs to say a very familiar story because it has to do with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But look at verses 45 down through 50. It says, now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran, took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and offered to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So, well, let's pray before we go any farther. Father, thank you so much for your presence being there. You have promised that where two or three are gathered in your name that you would be in our midst. And we truly have done that here this morning. Thank you for the way you've already been working and what you're going to continue to do. And I just pray your word will go forth with the power and authority that it has. Knowing that your word does not return void. But it always accomplishes what it sets out. May you continue to work on hearts. May you draw us to you. And may we respond with every message that we need to do, whether it's for salvation, whether it's for encouragement, whatever it is you're saying to our hearts, may we respond with a yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. And we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. A few months ago, uh, I came across an interesting article, at least the title of it. And it really caught my attention because of the way the title was worded. It said a, burg, said a homeowner fatally killed a dead man in attempted robbery. Now the reason I caught my attention was, it's bad enough we have live people robbing houses. When did dead men start robbing houses? And so whoever put that title in definitely wasn't thinking. And of course I had to read it to see if I, what I thought was true. And yeah, he was alive when he came and dead <laughs> before he could leave. I'll put it that way. Oh, I don't know about you, but one thing I appreciate about the Word of God, it never makes a mistake. There's a reason why we call it the inerrant, infallible Word of God. And it has so much depth to it. 
fact, Hebrews talks about it being a, a living word. Yes. Able even to divide asunder our soul and spirit. Our thoughts and intents. There's just so much depth to it. And what I'm hoping to do this morning is, is to share with you some of the things that we see on the surface in this passage. But also some of the things that we see under the surface. Because again, there's so much to it. So let's first look at verse 40, verse 45. It said, from the sixth hour into the ninth hour. Now, if you've got a modern translation, you know when that is. And if you don't, I'll tell you how they used to figure it out. To them, sunrise was always at 6 a.m. So you had six hours to six, you end up with noon. You had nine hours, you end up with 3 p.m. But notice, it is dark over all the land from noon till 3. That's not common. What would you do if this afternoon you stepped out of your house about 2 o'clock and it is pitch dark? Well, if you've got kids, you're probably wondering where they are, right? If they're outside, get them in. If they're inside, they're staying inside. But probably next, you're reaching for your phone and going, oh, what's the weather? Are we expecting a tornado? Are we expecting a, a, a hell storm? I mean, I, from what I understand, was it a few years ago you actually had a tropical storm come through? Was it dark, middle of the day with that? Then you get an idea of what's going on here because you're thinking this is not common. What's going on? And I imagine the people there at the cross are doing the same thing. Why is it dark? So what we see in the surface, it is dark physically. But if we dig a little bit, we find out it was dark spiritually. I mean, think about it. The very people who just a few days earlier, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, are yelling, Blessed is he, referring to Jesus, who comes in the name of the Lord. That was a compliment. But these are probably the same people then who were at the praetorium with Pilate are yelling, crucify Jesus, crucify him. And the very ones who are at the foot of the cross now yelling, if you really are the son of God, come down off of that cross. And that wasn't meant, it was really just meant as an insult. It was a dark day spiritually because it's the spiritual leaders, the Pharisees and Sadducees, who are behind all this. The ones who claim to know God and speak for God are the ones who want to kill the Son of God because they really didn't see Him as that. It's a dark day spiritually because His own disciples who the night before said, we will never deny you. And He looked at them and said, every one of you will be scattered. And at this point, there's only one disciple at the cross. His name is John, the brother of James. And he's not doing anything to get Jesus off. But last of all, it's a dark day spiritually because God is looking down and does nothing. I mean, for us, if we saw our son in trouble, would we do everything that we can to help them. But God is sitting back and choosing to do nothing. That leads into verse 46. Then. This is why Jesus is crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He feels alone. He feels rejected. He's wondering the God he's had so much fellowship with. Why do I feel like you're not there? And of course that, that, that brings up the obvious question which we have to dig deeper to find. Why? Why isn't God the Father doing anything? So we're going to come back to Matthew 27. If you want a bulletin, you may want to put it there or just put your finger or whatever. But we're going to look at a few other passages to help us understand why God is not. And the first one is Revelation 13, verse 8. Revelation 13, 
It's a very interesting chapter. If you've got a study Bible, you may even see some headings that say the, the beast from the sea. And the other half may say the beast from the earth. We know it more commonly as the Antichrist and the false prophet. And it's really about the, for lack of better, the leash that they are on. Because God's still in total control at this time, but he's allowing them to have some power. And in the midst of it, there's a really important verse. Verse 8. It says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Referring to the Antichrist. Whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb. And notice this. Slain from the foundation of the world. Not slain at the foundation. It's not that Jesus Christ would die twice. But the ideal is that even at the beginning of creation, it was God's plan to have Jesus killed. And so he's not going to interfere at this point. He's not going to ruin his own plan. He's perfect. He knows exactly what to do. But then that also then begs another question. Why is that his plan? We're going to go to the Old Testament for this one. If you'll turn to Isaiah chapter 59. The book of Isaiah has more things in it about Jesus than probably any other Old Testament book, except maybe Psalms. There are so many precious verses. This one's really an indirect one. But look at Isaiah 59 with verses 1 and 2. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, that's another word for sin, have separated you from your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. The reason it was God's plan to have Jesus Christ killed is because of sin. It was God's plan when he created Adam and Eve to have intimate, close fellowship with man. And yet, sin came in and ruined that. So God hates sin. I, I, I don't even know a word in our own language that describes how much God hates it. You and I may use that word casually. Do you ever talk about a food you hate to eat? You don't really just want to despise and kill it more than anything else in the world, right? Oh, I remember one time preaching at a church and I told him I didn't like broccoli. Oh, did I hear it afterwards? You need to like broccoli. Oh, <laughs> we all have certain foods we don't like and that's one with me. But for God, this is so much stronger. Despise. I mean, I've only ever heard one example, at least for me, made me feel like I'm beginning to understand the hatred God has for it. Because it's a story about a missionary who lives in Africa with his wife and his little girl. And one night, he and his wife, they tuck in his little girl to bed, and they go to their bedroom. And during the night, a black mama crawls in and curls up beside that little girl. And in her sleep, she rolls over on top of it. And just like that, it bites. The girl doesn't say a word. Not long before she dies. Sometime afterward, the snake left the bed and cr crawled to a corner of the bedroom. And when the missionary came in, he quickly saw the teeth marks on the little girl. And in the corner of his eye, he caught that snake over there in the corner, still asleep. He went to the kitchen and grabbed the biggest knives he could find. 
and crept quietly up to that snake and just quickly just cut off its head. But he's still so angry, he just kept chopping and chopping and chopping and chopping. How dare that snake take his little girl? But is that how God feels towards sin? How dare sin take that relationship, that fellowship that we were created to have with God? He hates it so much, it says he turns his back on it. That's the way he's just saying, I want nothing to do with it. It's an abomination. That's why. That's what's going on in Matthew 27. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Means we need at least one more verse to pull it all together before we go back to Matthew 27. And that is 2 Corinthians 5.21. Second Corinthians five twenty one. A lot of pronouns in this verse, but like easy to sort through. But it says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. For he, that refers to God, going back to verse 20. Made him, well there's only one person who knew no sin that lived on earth, Jesus Christ. So God made him, notice this, to be sin. Why? For us. That's you and me. Stop and think about that for a moment. The very thing that God hates the most Jesus said I will become talk about a love that's a deep love this one even says God made him made here is not the idea of forced them you're going to do it or else we do that to our kids right but this is the idea of made of crafted that God fashioned all this together. So when Jesus is crying out, why have you forsaken me? It is because sin he's taken upon himself. All the sin of the world. And God has to look down and say, I'm turning my back on it. I see sin. It's an abomination. It has ruined everything. And that helps us to explain then what's going on in verse 46. Going back to Matthew chapter 27. Because the next few verses already, already talk about the same thing. It says, they think Elijah's coming. And really, on the surface, that makes pretty good sense. Eli, Eli, could that be a shortened form of Elijah? You ever know anybody that has a shortened form of their name? Probably a lot of people, huh? <laughs> so they're thinking this could be a shortened form of Elijah. Second, it makes some sense because there's only two people in the Old Testament that never died. Elijah's one of them. God sent a fiery chariot down and took him to heaven. But the last one piece of evidence is why they think is Elijah is this. In the last book, in the last chapter of the Old Testament, Malachi 4, it says, and God will send Elijah again. And they're thinking, this must be the time. But wait, he's not here yet. We need to help Jesus. So they take a sponge, some say sour wine, some say vinegar, just something moist, put it on a, that sponge, put it on a stick, lift it up, wet his lips. And then verse 49 says, they sit back and say, 
Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. That's what we see in the surface. The truth is, under the surface, Jesus doesn't mean saved. We do. We are the sinners. We are the ones that need salvation. That's why God turns us back. It, it totally separates. And just to make sure we understand what sin is. In a very simple definition, it's whatever we do, whatever we say, whatever we think that displeases God. And if we're honest, we do that often. We have a sinful nature. And the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. And all come short of the glory of God. That means there has to be a remedy. And that's really what was going on in verse 20, excuse me, 47, 46. Make sure I say it right. Jesus is on the cross because the only thing that can wash away our sins is the death of Jesus Christ. His blood being shed. Because Hebrews makes that very clear. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. No forgiveness. That is the only thing that works. So it's not Jesus that needs saved. It's us. My question to you is, have you ever been saved? And keep in mind, we're not talking about a one-time experience because salvation is really about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because that's really what sin came in ruin. It's really what God wanted from the very beginning. Not just a one-time thing, but when you invite Jesus Christ into your heart. When you realize you are a sinner. When you realize He's the only answer to your sin. And you call upon Him to be your Lord and Savior. Really what you're saying, I want to spend my life with you. And it's a relationship then where you get to become intimate with God now because the way has been made. I think we just read about that or sang about that. He's a way maker, right? Wow. I love the way things work together. But have you ever done that? It won't be that long before we have an invitation. And it's very simple. Have you never done that? I invite you to come forward. If you're not sure, I invite you to come forward. But it's about a relationship. And are you still growing in that relationship? That is so important as well. That's why I'm going to jump to verse 50. Last part of that verse says, And he yielded up his spirit. It's really just a poetic way of saying he died. The cross was really horrific compared to everything that we know. The Romans were not the ones who created it, invented it. But as far as they were concerned, they perfected it. Because they didn't just want death, they wanted humiliation and suffering as well. And the cross provided all that. You know, we've been talking about the, the blood but if you really think about it, he's bleeding from his head, from the crown of thorns hammered into his head. He's bleeding from many open wounds on his back because of the scourge. He's bleeding from the hands because of the nails. And he's bleeding from the feet, from the one nail. God wanted to make sure you understand that it wasn't just one drop that was spilled, but it as some have called a river, to make sure there be plenty of blood and it still flows today to cover our sins. But as bad as that is, a Roman historian tells us most people on the cross didn't die from loss of blood. It's actually suff suffocation. And the reason for that is, as they're hanging here, there's nothing holding up this part except a rope. And with the nails in the hands, your, your arms begin to quiver 
and begin to lose their strength. And you cannot hold your chest up anymore. And it's putting up so much pressure on the heart and lungs. So what the Romans did to keep that suffering going, they bent the legs. So what that means is you're pushing off the nail in your foot to raise yourself up, get some air, and sink back down. And for the most part, people didn't talk much on the cross. The more you talk, the more air you use. The more air you use, the more you need to push up on the foot. And eventually with the, the one nail and the two feet, you can, your legs then begin to quiver and begin to lose their strength. And you get to the point you cannot push up. And if that's really the case here, then what you got is Jesus. It would sound something like, it is finished. And he bows his head. Now, if we do that, though, we didn't read this part carefully. That's easy to think that, but look at verse 50 again. There's, there's a very important four-letter word that's in here. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. It was something along the line of, it is finished! It wasn't a cry of defeat that his life ended. It was a cry saying, God's salvation is finished. It is complete. It is now available to every person. Jesus didn't die like that because man crucified him. He was in total control the whole time. And I take it back up again. He chose the hour, the minute, the seconds. Total control. And so even though man thought they were crucifying the Son of God... Jesus was saying, I am in control and will show you if in three days I am greater than man. He's showing he is greater than sin. And in three days he will show he is greater than death. This is the God we're asking you to invite into your life. Not just somebody to be your savior and that's the end as if God is still somewhere up there. No. If he comes into your life, he comes in to stay. He comes in to be with you no matter what you go through. No matter what trials. No matter what you face. If he can conquer death and sin and man, he's more than able to tackle everything you go through. Wow. That's why I said I came to not just give you eternal life, but abundant life. A life that you can even have down here with God beside you every step of the way. As I said, here in a moment we're going to have an invitation. And the invitation is simple. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If not, I invite you to come forward. Make sure that is settled today. But if you do, maybe you need to come forward and just say, Hey, listen, I, I need to put... My faith back in God. I've been trying to handle it in my own, letting the worries get to me. But no. So let's be anxious for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known unto God, and the peace of God surpasses all understanding. That means you don't have to always understand it to know that it's working. I like that. <laughs> wow. But where do you stand with God? Let's pray. Father, I come before you. Again, thank you for your word. Again, it is so precious. Thank you for the way you've been working on hearts. And I pray you'll continue to work on during this invitation. But may you be glorified. May people respond to your message, because I am just the messenger. You're the one with the message of life. And so may you continue to work in hearts. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.